It's interesting, I've only got four calls on it. There's a lot of people at the egg that are very handy about it. Well, is it rented or not? Like it is rented. Part to the egg? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So who said it wasn't? been back and forth in, in discussions. I don't know. There's so many people touching it. I sure had a board meeting last night. I don't know the result. Are we ready? Call the City Kenora Committee the whole to order. Public information notices as required under notice bylaw 144-2007. The public is advised of Council's intention to adopt the following its July 19th, 2022 meeting. Authorize a budget amendment in the amount of $33,075 plus HST of which $8,740 is to be funded through the parking meters reserves and the balance of $24,335 plus total HST is to be funded through the park aid slash parking rentals reserve to upgrade the metered parking kiosk machine technology to EMV enabled credit card transactions. Amend the procedural bylaw to incorporate recommended administrative changes. Authorize a budget amendment in the amount of $112,040 to be funded primarily through private sector donations for the purchase of the Walter J. Phillips watercolor, Norman Bay, 1922. This time I'd ask everyone to rise and Councillor Van Wellingham to read the blessing. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the many blessings we enjoy in the city of Kenora. As we gather, we recognize that we are on Treaty 3 lands, which are steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations and Métis people today. We continue to be thankful for the partnerships with our Indigenous people. Give us wisdom in our minds, clearness in our thinking, truth in our speaking, and always love in our hearts so that we may try always to unite the citizens of Kenora. Be with us today and guide us in our decision making. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Councillor. At this time, I'd ask if any member wishes to declare peculiar interest in the general nature thereof, either on items on today's agenda or from a meeting in which a member was not in attendance. Uh, seeing none, ask for the reading on motion number one, please. Uh, thank you, Worship. Resolution number one moved by myself, seconded by Council McMillan. No, no, no. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> Resolution number one. Your Worship moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Smith, that the minutes from the last regular committee of the home meeting held June 7th, 2022, and the special committee of the home meetings held June 10th and 21st, 2022, be confirmed as written and filed. All in favor? Motion's carried. Good to see that we have a council that's all wants to participate today. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that'll be a carry forward throughout. Uh, at this time we have one deputation and Susie Mello. Mello? Yeah, perfect. Welcome you today. Um, Susie's gonna be leading us through the update on the park it, pocket park project. Welcome. Thanks. Is this my stage? Yes. <coughs> Sorry, I went to the wrong door. I even get a microphone. Hello, I'm, so I'm Susie Mello. Um, I'm a landscape architect with Brooke McElroy in Winnipeg, and we have partnered with um, Grounded Architecture here in Kenora, and we're working on this pocket park project. Um, who do I speak to to change the slides? Heather. Oh, okay, perfect. Oh, hello. <laughs> Hi, Heather. <laughs> Okay, so I, we did a presentation a couple months ago, just giving you an update back then, but I'm just gonna do a quick refresh. This won't take very long. I understand everyone's terribly busy. So 
this is back in April, the big snowstorm that came that particular day. And so we did an on-site feast celebration just to get information about the site and how people are using it and the needs and wants for it. So we had a site plan there and everyone interacted with it, wrote on it. Um, and that's in the next slide. So here it is. Here we did a quick summary, just taking all that information that was a fair bit on the site plan and summarized it on the right. Uh, next slide, please. This one you'll probably be familiar with. We showed last time. So we've translated into a, a place for everyone. Um, I don't know if you can see that. So we've taken all of the information that we collected on site and programmed it into how it can work functionally with the topography, which um, is a struggle on this site. There is a little bit of um, drainage issue on one side. So we're just trying to accommodate that and integrate it into the design with all of the needs and wants that came through that session. And there's also the element of the public washroom, which everyone I'm sure is aware of. Uh, so in terms of utilities, there is underground a place where it makes sense for it to be on site. So that was in the orange. There was green, was a lot of plantings, community gardens, um, that aspect of things, and then shelter, gathering, and seating. So there isn't a lot of seating. So that was one of the big things, and also for shade, because it is very exposed here. I should say this is by Northern Cellars and Systems <laughs> Along Treatment. I'm sure, I don't know if everyone knows where the site is, uh, but here it is on the next slide. So it's just on the corner of First Street and Chipman, Northern Sounds and Systems, you can see just on the bottom of the page. So there is a lot in between, and then the park site is along the sidewalk. So there is a, a site triangle, the corner site triangle, and also the meter setback that we're accounting for. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the design. So I'll just go through this very quickly, and if anyone has any questions or comments, and I'll just talk about our next steps too. So this is more so for your information and for the community of Kenora, and if there is any questions or feedback, you can definitely contact us afterwards. So the washer itself is uh, a prefab unit from Quick. So um, that is being coordinated separately, and we are <coughs> just selecting finishes with Megan. Um, we're working very closely with Megan, I should say. So the washer itself will have, we're looking at it having a mirror on it and integrating uh, a local artist. So we're looking into that right now. So if you have any recommendations for that as well, um, and integrating the cloth offerings that we had at that feast back in April. Uh, surface area, we're just going to, it's very simple power because it's more of an economical. Um, Solutions so are having concrete surfacing around the public washrooms just for accessibility. And granite mulch surfacing will be in this gathering space that we have just to the right of where the public washroom is. Uh, wood mulch surfacing will be in all of the plant planting beds, and all the planting beds are trying to use native plantings um, and selective trees where we can provide shade, um, but not obstruct the growth of. Um, fruit bearing plants or anything that's going to be uh, more of a community garden based aspect. Next slide please. Uh, one element that we found when we were on site that by putting those tents up a lot of people just sort of flock to where our vertical element was. Um, so we're looking at creating a shade structure, gathering structure. Uh, these are just precedent images on the side. Um, this is a project that we did in Thunder Bay just in the middle of here. Um, so we're looking at the, oh, okay. I, I probably don't even need a microphone, but, um, so we're now we're just doing making little models <coughs> to see how the shade and shadow are going to work on the site and ensuring that what we put there will actually create interest on the ground, but also provide shade at the same time. So these are just little models that we're creating now. And that's an aspect where we're, we're trying to figure out together with Sean Bailey, who is also with the University of Manitoba. He has a land-based learning um, site here in Kenora, so we're looking to see if there's a way we can integrate community and students into the creation of that piece as well. So that's something we're looking into. Um, next slide, is there one more? Oh yeah, well these ones we just sort of, we're trying to keep space open. We don't want to over-program it, so we're talking to a few agencies here in and organizations in Kenora to see how this space could be used. So Harvest Kenora, we've spoken to Jake and seeing if there's a way for maintenance of the plantings, but also an educational component with the plantings. I know that they have their outdoor market, so we were looking at how much space we could put in here if there was to be an outdoor market. So this is just an example of how the space can be used. Next slide, please. 
Um, and if you wanted to do food trucks, you could put a lot of, uh, quite a few tables in there. Um, the site seems small, but when you put people in the context, it, there's a lot of uses that can come from it. Next slide, please. Um, and then this is just the final slide that we showed, collab potential collaborations for music. So because we have Northern Sounds and Systems there too, if there's a way that we can integrate that into the shape structure for gathering um, events that happen here. And then the pop-up piano that has happened a few times with Stephen Wolf, that there's a piano there to show you to scale how that could work. So next steps, um, of course, comments and feedback from you and the community. Um, we're working on the D package and we're going to be the design development package. I'll be sending that to Megan um, for comments in the next few days. And the, we're and then we're it's more so more developed into a construction set. So that we're hoping to do mid August, um, and then construction starting this year, and then the public washroom is be, will be made off site and be here in October. <coughs> That's it for me. If there's any questions or comments. Councillors. Councillor Van Wallingham, please. Thank you. The last few months there's been a real push for autism awareness and some of the parks now have a special place for the kids with autism. And I believe the Norman Park here now has one stays. Is there anything to be incorporated <coughs> into this to deal with that? No, I've not, that, not yet, but it definitely could be. Um, would that be you I would speak further about? Well, maybe I can just speak to what we have in Norman. So, okay. so we've just put a comment station in, uh, in, in, in its order. It's not in as yet. Uh, I can send you what that, some information to see what that looks like and see if that's a fit for this particular order. And what's the, what is the comment station? It's for kids with, with autism. And when they uh, are overstimulated, um, they they found that uh, these stations were very well at, at calming them down. It just gives them a lot of different things to uh, refocus their okay, uh, so it's their attention. It is. Okay. But I can send you up on. Sure, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Anyone else? Looks good. Uh, Councillor Goss, please. You know, I'm, I'm wondering which which shading shade structure are we working with here, and, and what does that present for us? Yeah, so the in if you were a bird in the sky in the plan view um, where it says E, that's sort of just a very conceptual plan of it. Uh, right now, we're we're developing that, so it would be fairly simple in that it'll be wood posts. Um, the screening itself is what we're playing with, and the angle to see if there's interest in the patterning so that when there is shade and sun it would create a pattern on the ground but also at the same time it would provide shade for whoever is using that space so that's being developed now but it would be similar to kind of like these slats that are being used on the spirit garden in thunder bay um that's sort of what we're looking at and angling them in different directions and the spacing between them to see what that will provide on the ground so would we see this design before and, and get approval on this design or we're just doing carte blanche yeah that one for sure um that one's going to be more in model based so we could send um images of the 3d model yeah okay I, i'd like to see that because sure. I, I sense some some issues and problems arising there but uh, i don't want to just go carte blanche we've already have had a little issue with that already and community outrage is something we have to watch for um, and it has to be it has to be fitting so I'd like to see before we make any move on that. Sure, the, the, sir. The, the critical unit here was the, was the washroom, and uh, <coughs> we've, been, we've been delayed on this for quite a while now, mm -hmm. from, from the time that we ordered the washroom room initially. So I'd like to see something progress, and something progress fairly quickly, but I would also like the council has some input into, uh, into what it's going to look like. Could you, would it help to clarify what the issues are so that when we're designing it, we can keep that in mind? Well, uh, it does seem to be a magnet for people to hang out, and I'm just wondering if, if that's what we're going to create. Yeah, that right whole, now that we... whole section of town is uh, has become problematic. I don't want to be uh, to be over effusive on that, but uh, there are issues in that area with, uh, with a lot of people that uh, just seem to uh, congregate. And uh, as we look forward, we have to be able to deal with that in ways that uh, that work properly, socially, and uh, acceptable to the entire community. Okay. 
Mr. Smith, please. Yeah, and just in um, follow up with Councillor uh, Goss's comment, that's like a pergolous concept, right? For shade. Yeah, it's not solid. Yeah. No. Yeah. I like pergolas. <laughs> You do. Yeah. Okay. I like <laughs> right. First, we'll, no, I mean, we'll make first sure you we'll put it there. Preferences will be on. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? <laughs> uh, I just have two just for clarification. Sure. The lot between where we're developing and Northern Sounds, mm -hmm. we don't own that anymore, do we? Is that we sold or? Planet? Yeah, correct. It's sold, correct? Okay. And from a financial perspective, all the funds required to complete this project were included in the 2022 capital budget. So we won't. We do have an additional contribution that we've received from partner organizations, so we will likely be making a budget amendment just to recognize that so that it's included. Um, but all of the other funds, like the city's contribution and the math contribution and everything else is going on. Thanks. All right, we're good then. Thank you very much Thank for your time you. and for explaining it. Yeah, no problem. I will see you soon. I'll give more info. All right. So we'll go to corporate services. And first item on the agenda is Charlotte, uh, the May 2021 financial statements. 22. Yeah, I'm just reading verbatim what's in front of me as opposed to. That was on me. On the agenda. Okay. <coughs> uh, thank you. Uh, nothing that um, is a concern in, in these financial statements so far. Um, this is by no means a report on our uh, vacancy recovery. Uh, however, I think that as time goes on, we're seeing that we're going to more than likely yeah. meet our target um, with the vacancies that we've had so far this year. But again, I'm not. I'm not State. I'm not going into reverted lane on that one, but I think we're, um, we're looking at it's been in a bad thing. Um, having all the pieces. Um, so, uh, roads department, we're still not seeing the full impact of the flood um, disaster uh, expenses, and I, those will really the major ones are going to start hitting in the June financial statements, even though. Uh, we declare the emergency in May by the time invoices came in. And, um, you're going to start seeing that happening in June. Or in June. And I had a total, and I sent it to everybody, and I can't remember what it was, uh, 300 and some thousand dollars on those total expenses up until last week. So Stace is looking up uh, the email because I sent it to the leadership team. Um, so Charlotte, on that, when we get, say, the June statements, have you created a separate line item? So you We've can track created three separate line items in three different departments. One is loose top roads, one is emergency services, and uh, one is parks. Because we thought those were the three departments that were most impacted, and so staff knows that they need to go to those specific accounts. Thank you. So I'm just taking the totals from those accounts. We still haven't accrued things like, uh, I don't know, and I'll check with payroll if uh, non-union overtime is going in there. It is okay, okay. so, you know. Okay, uh, winter control maintenance, um, we're almost at budget already, um, and we haven't had a second winter season this fiscal year. Um, Again, we're, we'll determine what comes out of the million dollar reserve uh, when your end is done next year, because right now we're still within the budget. But of course, we'll, we'll more than likely go over to, towards the end of this year. Um, vehicles and equipment. Um, so just so you know, uh, the May recoveries or the credits to the expenses haven't been posted, so we only have till the end of April. But the trend that I'm seeing in those accounts is that we are, in some cases, with some pieces of equipment uh, already over budget with respect to diesel costs. So we're, we're already seeing the impact of the increase in gas prices. So we can anticipate we're going to take a, a hit there because some of them are already over budget and this is just until the end of May, unfortunately. Um, other 
than that, water and sewer, we're still going to do the year-end adjustments on those. Um, I'm not seeing anything that is impactful so far, but stay tuned for, for some of these um, beyond our control influences on some of our expenses. We're definitely uh, seeing that trend starting now. Questions? Councillor Smith, please. Yeah, I have a, I have a couple, and um, Charlotte, you kind of alluded to um, the vacancy management, and um, that we'll get a more fulsome report. I'm really interested in that because I'm still trying to get my head around how this is going to work, and I noticed that um, you have a line under um, general government for human resources, and that's where we're going to be reporting that through, and I see that the budget is actual and then um, what has been um, used in the budget. So I'm really interested in more of an in-depth report to see how that's um, in the future. Yep. I'm not asking for that now no. or for we, next week. We have provided there one in yeah. quarterly, right? Yeah, so uh, for August, we will get the second quarter report. We prepared for the August council meeting. Yeah, that, that's great because I, I'm still struggling with this one. So I'm just going to put that out there right now. I think Charlotte is too. <laughs> It's a little bit complicated, so I'm glad that we're going to get a more fulsome thing because it'll take a while to figure out for us how this is going to work and how it impacts the budget and the staffing. That. So thanks for that, Roberta. But it does have common sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my other thing is um, mm -hmm. the municipal accommodation tax report is not still not included in the financial oh, statement. Sure. Um, I just think it's for next one. Sure. Yeah, for always, for Charlotte, because that's really good information that sure. you to have, and I'm I'm really interested in it. And so my other thing is you talked about water and sewer, and, and we did get some funding to do the second street. Some of that rehabilitation is, um, is for w the water and sewer systems is ongoing right now. So did that money get transferred right over into the water and sewer budgets when that funding came in? So we did account for, um, are you maybe talking about the green stream? Yes. The yeah. Uh, that is going to be used for the water and sewer. So that just works right into the water and sewer budget, yes. right? Those numbers. Yeah, I think the ISIP green was specific to yes. water. 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 So okay. I, I water. believe we had it in as revenue, correct? Uh, a funding source for the capital. Just, yeah, that's, you're not going to see it in these financial statements because these no, are all because it's capital. Yes. yes. Okay. That's good. I was just wondering how that would but work. But it's out. specifically for water, absolutely. And it, <clears> it is a funding source and a Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the answering those questions. Councilor Ford. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, so I'm looking at the revenue on uh, environmental services, and I, should we uh, should we be somewhat concerned about uh, the difference there? Uh, there's quite a stark uh, variance uh, year over year. I know the I know the revenue has increased substantially. Um, but the actual revenue to date is really not much further ahead than it was last year at this time. Is there something? We usually see our highest peaks in our summer season code. We do. Um, and also, we're going to do the year end uh, accrual and reversal. So, promise you for okay. next month, you'll see that. Okay. So, would, would it be fair to say then that next month will be more reflective of our yeah. real time? The budgets for that would also reflect that the significant revenues increases don't actually start until July 1st. That's when the new, that's when the bag take. Okay, but yes, but the, the um, solid waste department, yes, for sure. Uh, sewer and water was January 1st. The January's, or the sewer and water one, We've all, I've always struggled with because there seems to be no consistency in terms of when revenues of those accruals, depending on when you, you make those entries, really impacts our numbers, which when you're trying to compare a year to year, like Council yeah. Corey is and, and we'll it really distorts the numbers. We like to get them audited first before we do the, the journal entry because it's a very complicated calculation. 
um, and the auditor has, has now looked at it. Okay. Anyone else? All right, thank you. Um, the municipal <coughs> insurance renewal for 2022-23. Roberta, 23. you're leading this one? Yes, so we're presenting the 2022-2023 uh, Municipal Insurance Renewal. Um, this uh, renewal uh, is our, for our whole uh, insurance profile, um, and we we're working with Westline Insurance Group as our managing agent to support uh, this renewal. Um, so the renewal for this year, uh, we were actually anticipating a 25% increase, uh, which is uh, on the conservative end, actually, of, from other municipalities, we were really pleased to see that we our increase was just under 20%. So uh, it's about an $85,000 uh, increase to last year. So the total would be $531,257 plus applicable taxes. Um, in terms of uh, this year, we had some very interesting information gathered through our treasurer's group, which was really uh, valuable. Uh, so out of 46 municipalities in the 15,000 to 50, or 50, uh, 46 municipalities uh, participated, um, five of which were our direct comparators, which were 15,000 to 50,000 uh, population. Um, and so of that, uh, we were really able to evaluate not only our general liability, but also our cost. And we're pleased to say that uh, we, uh, at $6.74 per population, we're we are one of the cheapest or most affordable insurance programs. So uh, that was really valuable information for us, especially as we're looking at not only the comprehensiveness of our insurance, but also just the value for dollar. Um, in terms of uh, the overall service, uh, we are comprehensive, and I would um, encourage council to really focus on page five of the uh, municipal program. Uh, what that uh, highlights is really the value-added services that we get through our relationship um, with Westland and Intact Public Insurance. Uh, we receive uh, risk management advice and guidance. We also receive um, claims management services. And I have to say the uh, services that are provided not only in information and research and, and uh, just uh, best practice, but also the support in managing our claims and working through some of those processes has been significant. Uh, and that relationship, uh, both with Intact Public Insurance Entities and Westland has proved very valuable and has really set us on a path forward as we start to look at some of our programs where we could uh, potentially um, provide different service that will, will further benefit our insurance uh, program as a whole. Uh, I think lastly, uh, in addition to not only presenting the renewal, uh, there was a second recommendation that Council uh, directs administration to look at cyber insurance and to pre present back some options. Uh, it was noted through the survey that we were the only single tier municipality without cyber insurance. Uh, we do have a number of systems uh, that we host that collect uh, all kinds of data on our uh, residents, whether it's recreation, signing up for recreation, or processing payments through our, our uh, direct purchase. Um, we have data and cyber insurance is an important part to our overall insurance portfolio. So, uh, so those are the two elements is really the program as a whole, as well as exploring cyber insurance and, and flushing that component out in our program. Council? Yeah. Councillor McMillan, please. Thank you. <coughs> Roberta, it's, it's, it's a bit of an odd question, but maybe it's not. I was reading uh, somewhere in, in the package about uh, uh, like council liability insurance. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I, I bring that forward is in recent years and more so in the future, there's more liabilities and it's a very litigious mm -hmm. uh, environment we work in as well as staff. So, and I, am I correct that that's been addressed in the policy, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Councillor Van Wellingham, then Councillor Smith, please. Okay, thank you. This Westland Insurance Group, is any of uh, Kenora companies affiliated with that at all? I'm sorry, I'm not understanding the question. Uh, the companies that had the insurance before? Uh, it's just because they've been bought. It was yeah. and it's been bought. That's what I think he's asking. Well, it's modern. 
Yeah, yeah. It has changed names a couple of times. So Frank oh. Cowan and then Gillian's. It was, yeah, it was, um, there's two changes. So it was Gillian's formerly. Yeah. Now it's West Lebanon Insurance. So, so we're the same, same company. It's we're we're, in, oh. we're insured through Intact, but we yes. do all of our work through the Kenora office of West Lebanon. West Lebanon. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. They're like our management yeah. agent. Managing agent. Like Shelly McCool is a company. Exactly. Oh. Yes. The same. Yeah. Yes. And cross from the <laughs> and, and, and again, you know, just speaking from managing in a number of different environments, uh, similar to a third party administrator, this, this relationship is super valuable. We're able to call up and say, hey, you know what, we're, we're looking at claims for potholes. Uh, can you give us, you know, some things that we should be looking at to improve our service? Uh, some uh, ways that we can educate public, you know, how do we go about this? So they've been really responsive and able to provide us that information. So it's a wonderful relationship. Yeah, Shelly, I'm just going to say Shelly's been amazing. We've worked with her for years, so yeah, excellent. But my comment is, you know, for property taxpayers, when you're looking at an insurance premium of $531,000, that's a lot of money of property taxes, and really, uh, taxpayers can see no tangible benefit to it, so it's like you just pay it out, and it's, uh, it's a hard one, all those insurance costs for property taxpayers. Anyone else? I just have one question, Roberta. On the, when you talk about the open liabilities and auto claims, those are over a period of time, right? They just haven't been finalized. It's not like those have all occurred in 2022. Those, those have occurred in 2022. They have. Yeah. So, so just uh, picking up off of that comment and tagging on to Councillor Smith's comment, insurance has actually saved uh, the taxpayer money when we have some significant claims. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I will refer to our largest claim was, I believe it was the rec center roof, or an arena roof. Uh, that would have been the whole value of our insurance program paid out in one swoop. So, you know, insurance does allow us to transfer that risk and to be able to have more manageable costs associated with that. So when, when and if there is a hazard, uh, we're able to actually recoup and pay for it without going back to the taxpayer and impacting our operating budget. So, so there is a significant value, but this is uh, this is our claims experience. We do uh, incur claim, and this year related to uh, our pothole situation, just the money free thaw free thaw type types of situations that was imp impacting our infrastructure. Uh, we did experience <coughs> claims this year. Thank you. Thanks. That's good clarification. Thanks, Roberta. All right, we're good. Thanks, Roberta. Um, we'll move on to the budget amendment for metered parking kiosks. Heather, are you speaking to this one? Yeah, that's me. So, um, as council is aware, we moved to, to, to the new metered parking kiosks. Uh, this will be the second summer, uh, moving away from the metered individual parking meters in most areas. There are still some areas that have um, the individual meters. And um, these new metered parking kiosks, we were just made aware that they require a significant upgrade to the software that processes the uh, payment. Um, with this new EMV payment method, uh, it will bring some positive things where now people will be able to use Interact, Apple Pay, um, modernized technology outside of just credit cards. So there is some positive to that, but there is a significant attached to the software um, upgrades for each of these machines. So the impact to uh, to this budget amendment is 33075 plus HST. Um, and really, it, we don't have a lot of choice, unfortunately, with this change. So it's technology improvements to the machines. And um, without them, the credit payment or any sort of um, electronic payment will not work. It will only take uh, cash. Council? Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Move on to the procedural bylaw review, please. So as part of my ongoing um, policy reviews prior to this election coming this fall, uh, the procedural bylaw is also part of that review, and this is an opportunity for the current council to make recommendations to a future council in, um, in changes to the procedural bylaw. So things that they feel may have worked well, things that could be tweaked, um, 
and there's been a couple of areas that have been specifically asked of me as the clerk to look into for consideration and to be brought before council. Those areas are outlined within the report. Um, one includes the deputy mayor, um, one includes the proxy voting, and then a consent agenda. So if we start with the deputy mayor, um, we have had the same process in appointing our deputy mayor for as long as I can remember. Um, so for sure since an elevation. Um, and that is an eight month rotational process where upon um, council being elected, goes in alphabetical order and it goes on an eight month rotation. So there's there's really no volunteering, it's just here's your time and uh, this is when it falls to you. So there are some options. I did some research with various municipalities, reached out to clerks across the province and what those municipalities do and it varies. Uh, there's different processes for each municipality. For the most part, uh, most of the municipalities have very similar to what we have. So that it's a rotational process which allows um, various members of council to have an opportunity to um, have deputy mayor responsibilities and have an opportunity to experience the um, you know, chairing of meetings and things like that. So I don't know if you want to start in, start with the deputy mayor discussion, if you want to move to report that way, or if you want to just talk to council. Are we only looking, like having a robust discussion on these three items? No, you can, it's yours now. You can discuss the whole procedural bylaw if you want. Why don't you go through the three major ones? Okay. And we'll do, deal with those. Yeah. And then if people have identified the other issues when they went through the review, then we can deal with them individually. Sure. Okay. So we'll start with the deputy mayor. It's first on the list. Um, I provided some options within the report. Uh, including it as part of the election ballot for the public votes for the deputy directly, um, member of council with the highest number of votes in the election, and annually reviewed and appointed instead of it being appointed for a four year term in an alphabetical order or remaining uh, what it is today, which is appointed on a set rotational basis for the entire term. Okay, so. If, the, what my concern was, I raised this issue as, I, yes, it was me, sure, or Councillor Smith. If there's, if you look back, and I've only been here for eight years, but there, some people aren't comfortable being in the chair. Some people haven't done a very good job in the chair when I look back over the eight years. I'm, I'm looking, I'm not, I'm talking to you, but I'm not. <laughs> it's just stand up. It, it really, as the, my perspective from the mayor's is different than when I sat uh, at that as a councillor. Is that the deputy mayor is very important to ensuring that the mayor can do his job effectively. Um, it that consistency, having somebody in the chair that you know runs very good meetings is, you know, just the experience and knowledge they gain, it, it just really, um, I, I think it would benefit council. But that's my personal view and that's what we have to discuss and is, number one, if, if that's what we think we should have, and then it would be, okay, so then do we do it on an annual basis? Do we do it for a four year term? Like Heather's provided us, I'm sorry, the clerk has provided us with a number of options. So that's where I was coming from when I suggested having a full-time councillor. I think, um, <clears throat> having been around for a while and fully respecting the fact that I'm not going to be here next term, I think there's a great deal of merit in looking at um, a deputy mayor, either whether it's be for a year or four years. and. Uh, support uh, a good portion of what you're saying, Dan, with respect to consistency, um, having somebody in contact, also the consistency with staff. Um, a, a question I'd have for Heather, like I think there's, having read it, there's a number of good options here. Is it unrealistic to think that once uh, a council is elected in this term that they would 
they could appoint a deputy mayor for a period of a year or two years. Could they? Could that be done? Yeah, it's just whatever, however we write it in the procedure bylaw. Okay. So it would be up to this council. We want to identify that process, um, but it would be up to this council to appoint. Yeah, I think it's not done through the election process. Yeah, I guess one other comment for me, because of the closeness to the election, I I think it would be cumbersome to have it on the ballot, mm -hmm. and I think it would make more. Okay, I'm only speaking for myself and my thoughts. I think it would make more sense to have it uh, the council after the first after the election and the first orientation meeting to elect a deputy mayor. And, and it would be up to that council whether they wanted to do it for a year, two years, or three years. That, and then, again, I'm not going to be here, so those are just my thoughts. Thank you. Councillor Goss? And then there's another another potential wrinkle in that uh, um, it's a matter of close, who chairs the closed sessions, and is there a, a difficulty or an issue with the mayor uh, conducting the closed sessions? You're, you're going to certainly have some continuity of... Uh, of form and uh, and meeting structure, uh, that's that's another potential. That's somewhere else. Yeah. Just for clarification, if you could sure. share that point. Um, I did put in a comment in on the procedural bylaw, the actual bylaw review for um, council to consider. There's, I know the history of why that and and that is pretty consistent across the province for procedure bylaws. So in order to provide that deputy mayor that opportunity to have exposure, you might have a mayor that in two years never misses a meeting, and so then you have to chair one meeting, and you know it, it's hard when you're not getting that experience or exposure. So the reason they have the deputy mayor chairing the in-camera session is for that reason, is to serve that they get exposure and experience chairing the meetings. Um, so, we can write the procedure. We'll come back to that. Yeah, we can write that however yes. you want. Councilor Corey. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, so I'm I'm with uh, <clears throat> I'm with the mayor in that I I totally agree with this direction. Um, I don't like the rotational <coughs> thing. Um, I think um, over the years things have become so complex. Um, unless we're prepared to put a mayor in full time. And pay them as a full-time employee or mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, he or she, whoever it is, need, uh, needs assistance. Uh, the rotational thing is great if people want to have exposure to running meetings and that. There's nothing to say that that couldn't happen anyhow. Um, so, like, I, I really like this direction. I, I just had a couple of uh, questions in that. Um, when you say include as part of an election, that does someone run as a deputy mayor? Like, well, I, I don't. Like so we would have to word the ballot to ensure that it's clear that you're electing this person. It's still a member of council. You're voting a member of council, but as the deputy mayor. So the wording is very specific on the ballot. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the one with the highest votes in that, uh, I don't agree with. Um, I, I just don't think that's the way. I think if, you know, if, if the public or if the electorate, votes for someone who wants to be a deputy mayor that that's fine um but with the highest votes i i don't i don't like that at all um and the other thing is um personally i'd like to see where you have your peers around the table and that mm -hmm. decide who that he or she whoever it would be um and i think um, to me that's the fairest way or whatever uh short of somehow doing it as a vote but i I mean, that's a lot of work, as Councilman Nolan said. But I, I agree. I like this direction. I think it's long overdue. I, I know it was maybe done at some point previous, like with some municipalities. Yeah. Uh, I know current municipalities that do it that are much smaller than Kenora, and they seem to work well. Um, and everybody has their own way of determining how you get to that point. But I, I, I think it's... I think the time has come where um, the mayor, whoever it is, uh, needs some assistance there. So, uh, because they're strapped with everything, and it's um, I, I don't think uh, I don't think that functions properly. So, I support this. Anyone else? Oh, Councillor Smith. Yeah. So I'm going to take the opposite tact and um, 
um, support system we have now because I don't think there's a problem we're trying to solve for here. I don't see a problem. I think it functions very well. That's my opinion. Um, a council is seven people and with the mayor as the head and the mayor's only responsibility that is different from councillor is as a spokesperson for, for council. And if you add a deputy mayor position in, that further separates um, the leadership of council from the rest of council. Council should be a body. So um, I think you, that would lead to all sorts of problems. When you look at the deputy, deputy mayor rotation, that's a succession plan. That's training and development. If we want to encourage younger people to get involved in politics, being a councillor is a stepping stone to being a mayor. That's a learning opportunity. So if you're not running a meeting that, um, that's a judgmental call, if you're not running a meeting um, in accordance to a good principles when it's running a meeting, correct that behavior. Um, when you have um, younger people running for counselor, council, they tend to be, have young families, full-time jobs, and um, being on council is not a part-time job. There's a lot of work involved. So if you're going to be assuming additional per, um, duties as um, a younger counselor with families, they might not be able to take that on, especially women. So um, they might have to step back and not have capacity to take on that role. So at a full time, that disadvantaged them. An eight month rotation works because everybody gets that exposure. Not everybody will like it. They may decide being a counselor is for me, but being mayor is just something um, that I'm not willing to do because of the hard work involved. It allows people to make that decision. So um, I think it's, um, like I said, I don't think there's a problem that needs solving here. I think if we, if we look at, at grooming younger members of, of the community to want to be involved, you have to give them that exposure to being a mayor. That's part of being on council. I just think that that eight month rotation we do it with staff. We offer them succession planning and training development. Why would it be different as a, as a council? We want younger people to come out um, and be on council and be future leaders in this community. We have to give them the opportunity to develop those skills and or decide whether or not that's a job they want in the future or not. So why would you take that opportunity away from, from people? And I'm just going to put it out there that sometimes it's a struggle on council when um, you might have two people in a leadership capacity and might marginalize others on, on council. I think that it's important we re remain a council as a body. That's how we're set up, that's good government governance, and um, I fully support the rotational uh, process we have now because there's lots of valid reasons to keep it in place. I would just respond, and this goes far beyond chairing a, a, a closed session meeting. I'll give you an example. We're dealing with a, a matter right now that potentially impacts the city $4 million a year. And so on a rotation, if I'm not available and the deputy mayor steps in, they have no knowledge of what's going on. They, they learn, and then all of a sudden their eight months are over. And now we're right back. There are some things that go far beyond this table that encompass what the job is of being a counselor. And I, I don't think whether you have a deputy mayor full time or not changes whether or not we're a team around this council team. If we're if we're all here for the right reasons and we're working together, we will accomplish. You know. I thought I've tried to do a really good job of sharing information that we didn't always see in the past. So I think that's incumbent upon the team. And it, it doesn't matter whether you get to be eight months in as uh, running chairing meeting. That's my thoughts. Councillor Fox. Could I um, just supplement? Yep. Because I want to address your point. Is um, 
no other, if we're ad operating as a council, as one body, no other one councillor should have more information or have access to more information than another, any other councillor. That's what a deputy mayor will do. And that takes away from the one body, seven people on council. So I think that's um, um, more of a reason not to have a deputy mayor. Every council should be involved in all council business all the time. We should all have the same information all the time. Councillor Goss. So, uh, as I look at it, I look at the options here, uh, include as part of the election ballot. That's too cumbersome and presents all kinds of difficulties. A uh, member of council with the highest number of votes, I think that's, that to me, that's a no-go because uh, for one, that uh, disadvantages any of the incumbents because generally the incumbents don't always finish in the, in the top, on the top. Uh, I, I prefer, uh, rather than uh, the participant to medal or ribbon uh, method, I prefer that the city, the council as a whole, would annually review and appoint for a selected time. And that could be one year, that could be two years, that could be four years. There are people who, uh, who may not feel comfortable taking the role. There are people who may not be able to uh, efficiently move forward um, uh, closed session meetings. And I think that would all come through as, uh, as council has an opportunity to review and, and vote on that. So I, I'm, I'm looking at the third option, as, uh, which uh, uh, it probably is, the, is a fairly democratic and uh, it doesn't uh, uh, draw any lines between that member and the rest of council. Councillor Van Mullingham. Thank you, Ian. <coughs> I'm in favor of the current system, how it works here right now, too, with the rotational on the eight months. I think it works out really good and it gives a person the option to opt out and then the next one comes in. It's pretty simple. But I'm just curious, did it ever come up about the ward system at all in these different municipalities? Did you can already look at that at all? Um, I mean, there are ward systems. Every municipality is different. So there are ward systems across the province. But at amalgamation, the decision was made to um, go to one ward and not have councillors act as um, specific to one area of the community. So we broke away from the ward system. But is it still um, available in the province of Ontario? Yes. Can we do that in this election? No. We're past the timelines that that decision can be made. So that had to be made last at the end of the last year. So we're past that timelines to make any decision. So what do you need from us now? We've all had our say. I need direction because I need to present a procedural bylaw next week um, and I have to have consensus as far as what council's looking for that to look like. So um, if if you're looking for the rotation that or the not the so rotation to have one appointed, then I need how that appointment looks like so that I can prepare the procedural bylaw. So it would appear based on what everybody's saying that Majority of four deputy mayor. Mm -hmm. So then, how will that deputy mayor be appointed? So and it seems from what people said, they prefer the annual review. Number three. Yeah, I, sorry. Uh, I uh, again agree with the deputy mayor on that, but um, that's just minor window dressing from eight months to a year, or whatever. I think if you're going to do it, you do it. Um, you know, Mayor Raynard's right. Everybody who sits around here is part of the team. Uh, it's a matter of flow of information or whatever. Deputy Mayor, whoever it might be, might be involved in certain files or, or whatever the mayor deems or council deems necessary. All those details have to still be worked out. If you're gonna have a deputy mayor, have a deputy mayor. If you're, um, there's no really changing from a year, from eight months to a year. We're not really changing much. So from my perspective, um, I mean, I support the deputy mayor. Uh, it's either, either have it or don't have it um, for the term. Uh, maybe even two years would be OK in that. But I think on an annual basis, I guess it's just another thing that gets in the way of everything else that we're trying to deal with. So I'd rather see it for a longer period of time. But I, I mean, I support the concept of deputy mayor. but not the one year. Uh, I, I just don't think that goes far enough. OK, 
Okay, so Council Report is recommending a minimum of two years as if we go through this process. Are you for that? That, that would be determined by the new council. How, how, how long they, or not. The procedure bylaw will set in place what the rules are for the new council. So Heather, just to clarify, if council, the next council was to determine this internally, that would be done through secret ballot just at one of the initial meetings? It, yeah, it wouldn't be done unless it specifically said secret ballot, it would be a show of hands. We don't do secret ballots uh, unless it specifically says that. Um, so if, if council recommends that this change be made and it comes, the other thing that council can consider is they don't establish it, they leave it as eight month rotation, they let the new council make that decision. So there's that option. However, what happens then at, for those of you who've been on council um, for a long period of time, you'll recall that during the inaugural meeting, um, those that deputy mayor is appointed at that inaugural meeting and it's set up as their rotational basis during that meeting and it is done by resolution. So at the inaugural meeting, there needs to be a deputy mayor appointed um, or you don't have anyone, you would go to just a rotation starting in alphabetical order. But again, that needs to be clear in that by procedural bylaw. I think we're complicating it. Yeah. We, we establish whether we're going to do it, and we establish the time frame. So, if council party recommending a minimum two year. So, I'm not. I'm Councilor Smith. It doesn't matter to me. I'm good with the rotation that we're doing now every eight months, I think. Yeah. But I think we're what's going to come forward is the deputy mayor position for two years, or looked at for two every two years. Midway through the term of council. Well, okay. okay. Good. Right. And it would, just for clarification, it would be elected um, by council. the council as a whole. By the new council. Yeah. Okay. All right, could you lead us through proxy voting, please? So this was another area of um, concern identified by a number of council, just that this proxy voting was brought into effect during uh, the pandemic. So it was something that the province permitted um, under the municipal, uh, municipal act allows municipalities to have the authorization uh, to provide proxy voting by a member of council. So the bill that came into effect was obviously addressing the time um, with the pandemic and the concerns of, you know, if someone was to get sick for long periods of time, that their voice could still be heard at the council table. Now, since then, we have all sorts of electronic means to participate. Our, our procedure bylaw also allows you to participate uh, electronically. So the question is, has been presented of, you know, is proxy voting still the right thing to do to have within our bylaw? So many municipalities didn't move to proxy voting and didn't permit it. Um, this council uh, did wish to have that included in our procedural bylaw. So it's just something for consideration moving to the next council, uh, whether or not we want to continue with proxy voting. Mr. Smith, please. Yeah, I, I think that we should remove proxy voting, proxy voting from the procedural bylaw. I think it, it, it's um, an obligation and a responsibility of elected um, councillors to be at the table when a vote is taken. Um, new information comes um, sometimes right at a council meeting where a councillor will change their vote. I mean, it's happened to me. I think you need to be at the table to do that. I think it sends. Um, I, I, I don't like the message it sends when a councillor is not at the table and is proxying their vote. Um, and as Heather has pointed out, there's several opportunities um, when councillors are out of town on vacation or even at home ill to be um, um, able to participate electronically and, and, and uh, vote electronically. So I think the opportunities are there um, for councillors that will not be at uh, out of town when, when we're having meetings. So I would um, support removing proxy voting. Anyone else? We're still able to, to, to vote uh, electronically by 
in, in the distance. Yep, our procedure bylaw allows for that electronic participation. The only thing you don't count towards is form. So if you ever got to a point where you know, you're electronic, and the members in the room must count as the form. But the proxy doesn't create quorum either. No, it doesn't. Does anybody I've only heard from one council room. Well, with the, poten with the potential for voting uh, electronically in, in absentia or when you're online, I have no problem with removing the proxy voting. Yeah. I'm fine with removing it. Right. Yes. I, I feel kind of vulnerable because I'm not going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just giving my opinion. But it's, yeah. experience yeah. and knowledge is yeah. that's important. That's part you're of the process. Of the Thank you. Okay, so the last area is consent agendas. Um, it's something that I've considered for many years. We moved to um, a housekeeping uh, process, which allows, is, is similar to a consent agenda. However, housekeeping matters are still broken out by individual resolutions. So you'll see at peak times of the year when projects are starting and there's lots of different agreements and things like that, the agenda can be longer. Um, you know, we'll be up over 30 resolutions because of those individual a resolution consent agenda just condenses it all into one resolution and um, if there is something at the start of the meeting on the consent agenda that a member of council wants broken out we can do that um, and you still have all the same <coughs> opportunities to um, raise concerns about something that's on the consent agenda it just speeds things up that's really all it is council Corey, then council yeah, this, um, thanks mayor um, so Last, in May, we started this with the Kenora District Service Board and did exactly that, like the first time we did it. Uh, um, and we're still, uh, they're still working through the whole process, but it, it cut down the amount of time of talking about something that um, you should be fully aware of anyhow. Like if you have the information the reports in front of you and you do your, the work, put the time in ahead of time, um, it, it's fine, uh, and, and on that particular meeting, there was two items that were, that were identified at the beginning that were removed or broken out from the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. and then there was a discussion that ensued uh, throughout the meeting, but it, we had the same results, same information, and it probably cut down the meeting by over an hour mm -hmm. uh, on a five-hour meeting or whatever. An hour is a lot. Um, and everybody had all the appropriate information, and I think there's a very efficient way to uh, go or at least explore. So I, I'd be in support of uh, looking at that uh, scenario. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor McMillan. Um, I, would, I would support uh, moving to a consent agenda. The Library Board uses a consent agenda in space you're at 99.9% .9 of those meetings, and it worked pretty efficiently. And the onus falls upon me as a board member at the library to read the material and be prepared. And I find consent agendas are, are, are a good way of operating. Councillor Van Wellen, please. And uh, we're going to move ahead with this with a KDMA on Thursday. It comes up for discussion again. We'll probably follow KDSP. Smith, yeah, I, I'd be fine with that. Um, meetings tend to get long. Um, I do note that in Heather's report, she put something like financials could be collude, included in a consent agenda, and I would say that financials should never be included in a consent agenda. Budget is what drives our process and drives everything we do, and whether or not we comment on it, I think it needs to always stay standalone. I know that's just semantics going forward, but I wanted to throw that out there. I'm in favor of moving with the consent agenda. So just for following up on Councillor Smith's point, who establishes what goes into the consent agenda? And who, is it the clerk and the CAO or? Yeah, the clerk uh, typically will, I mean, in consultation with the CAO, but the clerk typically will look at the items that are coming forward and will um, do, so keeping in mind, it's similar to what our housekeeping reports have. If, if, there's no decision to be made. So when Charlotte reports her financial statements, you have lots of questions and you'd like more information, you want to understand that, but you can't 
change the information that she's presented. The numbers are the numbers. So it, 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 she may have to provide you for the uh, follow-up to it, but the numbers are the numbers. Similar to the minutes that come forward, the agreements, you, you've already discussed those, you already are aware of them. Now the funding agreements are coming forward for execution. So those are just items that are being presented to council, water and wastewater reports. It's the same thing, you can't change the content of what is in there. You can still ask questions, but those are the types of things that you would typically see on a consent agenda. We don't have to include financial statements. Lots of uh, municipalities do, instead of breaking out an individual um, resolution for it because you're you're just accepting the financial statements. But if the will of council is to not, we don't have to. So using those two examples you gave with the financials and the sewer and water, without, you can still question and get information without pulling them out? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So is that addressed? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it addresses mine too. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mayor. So I think we have consensus then on, on that one? Consensus on consent. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so then we'll go through. Mm -hmm. Councilor Goss, you raised an issue um, that wasn't part of the three that you wanted to have a discussion on. No. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you I did. I can't remember what it was. Um, uh, deputy chairing in, in camera. Right. I, I withdraw that. I understand that there are issues. There could be issues with that. That's, a, that's to me. That's a, that could be a burden on the mayor. And, well, I, I think by having, if if it goes through with the deputy mayor, then there is consistency in the chair. So. Yep. All right, Councilor McMillan. Just a, a, a technical question, Heather. Um, at any time. During the term of the council, the procedural bylaw can be revisited, correct? So, it's, if I may, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, with the new council coming in and whatever we adopt through this discussion, it can be re revisited by a new council, correct? Yeah. Okay. And typically, what I do um, is give it about a year, yeah. Yeah. eight to 12 months, and then I will bring the procedural bylaw again, a forward again for any recommendations that want to come to the new council. Um, typically by then the new council's you know pretty comfortable with procedure and process and they might have different concerns or ideas and they want to change during this that term of council. Thank you. Are there any other issues or questions council had on the the rest of the bylaw? All right. So Heather, you have everything you I'm sorry. I saw in your office for the which I don't think we would tend to. All right, so that brings us to uh, the blue box recycling transition. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Marco to lead us through it, please. Okay. So in Ontario, the blue box operations uh, are, are going to be changing here shortly uh, due to provincial regulation. And uh, basically, it'll be run by a producer based and operated funded program, which will consist a uh, collection of single family residences, multi family residences, long term care homes, retirement homes, and schools. Uh, Circular Materials of Ontario is the producer's firm that they have uh, selected to act on their behalf to. I guess run with the regulations and make the implemented changes uh, to the program throughout Ontario. Uh, currently, Circular Materials is offering uh, a transition period for those municipalities to either opt <coughs> out or opt out of recycling, uh, effective July, uh, with that term for the transition period being uh, effective July 1st, 2023, to uh, a termination period of December 31st, 2025. Uh, Circular Materials at this point in time is looking for direction from municipalities to make a decision whether they're going to opt in or opt out of this transition period to provide uh, curbside collection services. Uh, in opting out, uh, what would happen is Circular Materials would then uh, secure private contractors to replace the municipal collection curbside uh, services uh, again, with a private contractor, uh, should municipalities opt out. Uh, I 
make some notable facts in regards to the review of, of circular materials and materials and agreements that uh, they have presented to municipalities is the, the current agreement uh, that circular materials would be offering to municipalities to work as a contractor uh, under the under circular materials seems to be a reasonable contract for the city to enter into if we wanted to opt in. Uh, there's only really two minor concerns or, or flags, I guess, that came up in the agreement, and that was uh, extra reporting requirements that the city would be required to report back to circular materials with uh, certain information and data on the recycling collection system, which is thought to, to be you know, easily handled with the current staffing complement of, of staff and workload with the solid waste department. Second factor was is that we have to improve and upgrade some of our GPS uh, requirements in our fleet of trucks related to solid waste that uh, certain materials is looking for. Uh, and in contact with our GPS provider, uh, there didn't seem to be any kind of issues in terms of upgrading or providing that information uh, as required to satisfy that agreement. Another factor, uh, that needs to be noted, I guess, is the uh, collectibles at curbside would be delivered to a receiving facility which would be run by circular materials. And those receiving facilities have yet to be determined and circular materials is currently in a process of putting requests for proposals out for those receiving facilities. And at this point in time, all we've been told is that the receiving facility will be located within a 60 minute drive of a centroid of any municipality uh, that wants to deliver or needs to deliver its recy curbside collection uh, recyclables to that facility. Funding uh, arrangements as per the agreement would be uh, pegged at 100% cost recovery based on 2020 costs. Uh, of the recycling and quantities uh, that have been captured in the, and provided to circular materials for their, uh, I guess, creating of the agreements. Uh, and that's in contrast to the current funding uh, arrangement we have with the CIF fund, uh, which currently provides approximately 50% funding for the current uh, curbside collection and recycling uh, operations with the balance coming through uh, uh, taxation and net tax levy. Uh, there is a component of non-eligible uh, recycling materials uh, that are to be collected and uh, the city would have two options in dealing with non-eligible sources and that would be we could take those recyclables to a, a circular materials receiving facility but we do get deducted certain payments off of that in order to use that service. The other option is to continue on as we currently uh, uh, do in terms of finding source markets on our own and sending those non-eligible sources to, uh, for example, Winnipeg to either collect revenue or income from that uh, stream that's not eligible. And that would be the uh, commercial and industrial and some institutional uh, collections. Uh, in the agreement, there is a potential uh, for three one-year extensions, but again, beyond the 20 that would apply beyond the uh, December 2025 uh, transition uh, period ending but those would have to be uh, agreed to by circular materials in conjunction with the municipality to, to negotiate or, or uh, I guess enter into those one-year extensions uh, concurrently so at this point administration is is recommending the option to opt in and stay in recycling uh, during the transition period uh, due to the fact it provides synergies and cost sharing between garbage and recycling uh, operations in the solid waste department and it will also provide some extra time to during that two and a half year period to I guess assess the, the overall solid waste operations and how that might look uh, either trying to stay in recycling or getting out of recycling uh, after that December uh, 31st, 2025 date. So that uh, pretty much sums up 
where we're at and why we're recommending to opt in in this transition period for recycling and collection services. Council? Council Poirier, please. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, so, uh, good report, Marco. Uh, fully, fully support it, uh, and I fully, and, and I'm all for uh, like blue box and recycling and, and the whole program. But finally, now the cost is being borne by who it should be, which is the producer and the packagers and that. Because when you look at what when you buy something, uh, it's just it's totally insane how they package some of these items now. Uh, and it takes it off the tax bill, uh, where it shouldn't be any help, um, and it places it, it places that financial burden on the producer. So I'm I'm fully supportive of it, and uh, hopefully there's no kinks along the way before next next July 1st. Uh, but I mean, uh, I think it's a I think it's a great thing for the city and for the taxpayers. Councillor Smith, please. Yeah. Thanks for the report, Marco. It really, really lays out our options quite well, and I do agree with your recommendation going forward. And the fact that we have an opportunity to review uh, later on um, bodes well for us in the future, so that's good. Um, and Councillor Poirier has laid out um, the objective of this new um, recycling uh, box that the government has, has put forward. I think it falls for, far short of expectations of the communities. And it will be interesting to see if um, it changes producer behavior going forward. Will we see less packaging? It would be interesting to see if that actually does happen. So, yeah, but it is time that the consumer takes it on. They could have gone a lot farther. This is a good first step. Councillor Goss. I concur. I, I believe <laughs> we're a long way from what we were promised with the Waste Free Ontario Act, but uh, I think this is a step in the right direction. And I agree. Let's move some of this back onto the onto the shoulders of the producers. I'm on board. Uh, question to Charlotte. Right now, the taxpayer it's about a quarter million dollars the taxpayer is subsidizing. Yeah, maybe not quite that much um, right now, and and of course. Our, you know the budgeting for, for for the revenue on that side has been you know been pretty high and COVID yep. and so um, I'm watching to see if the revenue is actually important. Okay. So, Marco, my question would to you would be: um, Prior, we've had First Nation communities you know inquire about blue box service. Can they be part of it? And it's never really come to any fruition. Under the new scenario moving forward, they would would they they would deal directly with the, the new company. With it, or yeah, as, as far as we can tell, in the agreements that have been you know given to the municipalities here to enter into during that transition period, there's been no mention of First Nations uh, involvement as part of our program in, in this specific agreement. So I'm not sure if at some point in the future they'll be dealing with First Nations directly. Uh, but I guess the the uh, decision going forward by circular materials, from what we can see in the agreement, is they want to deal with the municipalities first, and perhaps maybe after this transition period, there might be some different uh, objectives and, and plans they have going forward. But at this point in time, they're just specifically looking within the city of our boundaries. So we've got direction then for the next to move this forward. Um, the next item is the budget amendment for the MUSE. Stace, are you speaking to this one? Yes, thank you. Um, Council, the report before you is related to a uh, budget amendment in the amount of $112,040 to be funded through private sector donations primarily for the Walter J. Phillips Watercolor Norman Bay uh, 1922. Uh, Council is aware that um, the foundational collection for the Douglas Family Art Center is comprised of the Walter J, or significant portion of the Walter J. Phillips collection. Um, since uh, the establishment of the Art Center in 2019, several additions to the collection have been made. Uh, and an important function of the Art Center is to manage that collection, which includes an art advisory committee, which makes rec reviews and makes recommendations and then provides those recommendations to the board for approval. 
2022, new staff became aware of two Walter J. Phillips uh, watercolors that were going on auctions at Waddington's. Um, both were deemed by the advisory committee to be uh, worthy of uh, purchasing and staff were tasked with uh, finding private donors for um, uh, these pieces of art. Um, it was determined that just the one piece would be uh, the piece that they wanted to go after based on the way that the auction was going and the curator and the primary donor were in attendance for the online auction and bidding was uh, done with all the donor's approval. Uh, when the hammer fell, the price was $90,000 and the closing costs, uh, the total purchase price of that was $122,040. And all funding of this purchase has, will be coming through four private donors with the exception of $10,000 which will be drawn through the Art Center's acquisition budget allocation. So if you look at the uh, operating budget of the, um, the Art Center, you will actually see a line item to the extent of $50,000. Uh, so this would have gone through the Art Advisory Committee, come to the board, and then you can see the motion, motion before you on June 22nd, uh, which outlines um, the motion that went to the board, which was unanimously approved. So uh, from a budget standpoint, again, um, $112,040 is going to come through private donors, and $10,000 uh, will be coming through the Art Acquisition uh, line item in the operating budget. Happy to answer any questions. Council? Uh, Councillor Smith, please. Happy that you put the emphasis on private donations. Loud and clear to the public. This is not coming out of property, taxpayers' pockets. The rumor about well, the husky, the musky, coming out of property, taxpayers' pockets is false. It needs to be clear in this community where the sources of funding comes from so we can settle those arguments right at council table. Thank you, Stace. Anyone else? All right, so the recommendation will come forward next week. Can I see a picture? I so did he also also <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you just happen to have it by your chair, right? Well, no better for next time. Thank you. Um, sorry. <coughs> Can I please see the yeah, thank you. operating graph? Yes, so the second report before you uh, is also related to um, the MUSE. It is for the MUSE operating uh, grant application. And um, so this is a uh, this is a grant that council would have seen some 35 times over the years. Uh, it comes through the Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism, and Culture, and uh, it is not built into the budget. But if successful, it will result in a positive positive budget impact in the amount of twenty nine thousand and ninety six dollars. That amount has not changed in the last ten years. So. Questions. So it's not built into the budget. Right. They they get it every year. Interesting. So then, if they get it every year and they get thirty thousand dollars, really they're asking for council for tax dollars of in excess. Of it's yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll do it. That. All right, uh, next one is the recovery fund. Yeah, uh, thank you. So uh, this recommendation is related to uh, council approving uh, the application to the museum assistance program. This is a new round of funding that has come through the federal government as a result of COVID-19. Um, and it is intended to fund uh, museums of a certain size that have been impacted by revenue losses due to uh, the pandemic. Uh, given the size of the uh, annual expenses of the museum uh, at the range between $2,000 and $1 million, uh, it is anticipated that this could have a positive impact of $42,000 if successful. Council? All right, thanks, Stace. And your last one, I believe, is the lease agreement extension. Yes, thank you. Uh, this report is related uh, to uh, the lease agreement with William W. Crichton Youth Services at Rapid Lake. Um, this, um, uh, and the recommendation is for council and uh, to allow the mayor clerk uh, to enter into a one-year uh, lease agreement for the former GM municipal offices. 
Um, what happened upon review is we realized that when the 2018 lease was signed that the, uh, it referenced a five-year term, but it actually only spoke to four years. So this is a one-year uh, lease uh, renewal, uh, which will align with the uh, intended verbiage of the initial lease. Questions? All right. Uh, before we, thanks, Stace. Before we go to development services, we need to go back to the procedural bylaw review. Uh, there was one item that we should have discussed that we missed. So, other yeah, just under the timing of meetings for uh, planning advisory uh, public meetings. So, uh, over the last couple of years, <coughs> councils asked a couple of different times or have made comments just on the timing of those meetings and. You know, uh, sometimes maybe the whole days are the three, four hours, and then we have to go into those public meetings. So it's been suggested on different times, different days. So it's just kind of something that's fairly important, especially for planning staff moving forward, that they know, you know, what councils when they're advertising public meetings, if there is a suggested change to the times or days, um, that we, we have that discussion now. So because it does form part of this procedure. You look perplexed. Well, well I'll just comment then because you're Please. looking at me. Um, <laughs> it, That's my natural <laughs> direction, I guess. It's just, you're it like is a actually. Sure. Yeah. So, um, what I know about the, and, and I get that, it's, but I, I personally, I like all my meetings in one day. If I come to town, having everything in one day really works well. Some of those, uh, the planning um, uh, meetings, um, bylaw amendments and that you'll come to town it's less than a 20 minute meeting so I know sometimes they're a little bit longer maybe sometimes a little bit shorter I don't have an opinion <laughs> let's just put it that way <laughs> Councillor Corey um, so what what's kind of the recommendation and consensus like they, they would be there's there's no like would they be moved to like at the end of the day or like Attach or just on a completely different day, or like what? Um, I've heard comments from various members of council of all of that. So maybe it should be on a different day, maybe it should be the, the after or work, maybe it should be the day. Like it's really the will of council and whether they want those to continue on a committee the whole day at noon. That was the direction of this council, so it's yeah. I'm staff are quite content with Tuesdays at noon. Guess is what I'll say. Uh, can I just uh, just one other clarification? When you said three hours, and that can you double that? Because they're they're not three hours. And That's just the open portion. Of yeah, the they're the they're, they're a day. <laughs> let's let's be honest. Like they're three or four o'clock. So um, okay. okay. Councilor McMillan, I uh, I would suggest they stay on the days of the meeting. I think Councilor Smith and others make a good point that. Although the days get long, maybe the consent agenda is going to help a bit. Yeah. Um, but to have the consistent mm -hmm. meetings on the same day as opposed to bringing people back, the advertising and all that sort of thing. And the other thing is, and Heather, correct me if I'm wrong, but a new council coming in may want to change the meeting times, mm -hmm. correct? Which, yep. which, they, which they can request. <coughs> so I would suggest leaving it on the same day. And that's a good point, Councilor Madelon. I didn't include that as part of the review, although Council had the opportunity to discuss that, but um, that really is for the incoming Council. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, this, or? No, the meeting times, like the okay. meeting times. So we will leave it as is then. Okay. I, personally, I do not like it. I just, I would rather we do it at 11 o'clock on a Council meeting just because on committee of the whole, Council Report is right. We start at 9. Mm -hmm. We don't get out of here until 3.30 if we're lucky. And so it just really pushes pushes it long. Having it before is very, very problematic. Mm -hmm. If we go long. And yeah. that's so. Yeah. Yeah. But normally the Council, we're done in an hour. Mm -hmm. So maybe we hold it after the Council meeting. Um, just but, like you say that. But you, you need a prescribed time, though, for, for, for public, public meetings. So. You need a prescribed time, and it has to start at that time. So it, it, it's, 
I was I was with Mayor Rayner on, on possibly moving it to the day of the, of the council meeting, but I could see that that could be problematic if we start to run into. And Councillor Smith's right. Some of them take tw you know nobody shows yep. up at all, mm -hmm. and other ones go on. And the other well. problem with having it as a council meeting is now you're delaying the decision for another month because it, the decision has Correct. to take place at council. So yeah. if you do it on a council date, now you have a whole month before mm -hmm. that decision. That's very, that would be great for people who have made the application and now have to sit and wait. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So now we go into development services. Excuse me, just before we get there, uh, there's a moment of, uh, to, for, to clarify, sorry. Uh, the $29,050 is actually built into the budget in the operating budget. Yeah. Uh, I apologize, that was my error. Okay. And the 42 isn't because it's a new program. Correct. Yeah. Right. Thank you for that. Yeah, I'm just trying to put it up here. So, site plan control impacts of Bill 109. We'll ask Kevin will, Sumner will speak to us. Welcome, Kevin. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, yes, yeah, so this is uh, very much, uh, I characterize this as a, a bookkeeping bylaw, uh, but uh, uh, one that's required. Uh, you know, are aware that Bill 109 was passed uh, this uh, spring and, and touched on a number of areas of the Planning Act, uh, many of which don't really impact our day-to-day -day operations, but there's in terms of Section 41, which is site plan control under the Planning Act, it does uh, directly impact uh, our bylaw and require us to update the, uh, our, our site plan control bylaw. Uh, specifically, our bylaw contains provisions currently that allow it to be bumped up to council for approval at, at council's request, uh, most specifically. Um, and this isn't something, a power that council has exercised in my time here, and I can't, I couldn't actually track down the last time it had been exercised. Mm -hmm. uh, but with the passage of Bill 109, it's no longer an option. Uh, uh, the bill is very specific in directing that uh, you know, site plan control applications cannot be considered and approved by council. So what we're proposing is amendments to the bylaw that uh, clearly uh, 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 change things to uh, administrative uh, approval without uh, options for bringing it up to council uh, to bring our uh, bylaw into compliance with uh, Bill 109's provisions, which took effect on uh, July 1st. Uh, there's a couple of other sections that change. Uh, the, the bill also allows a 60-day review period for uh, site plan control applications, at, at which time a decision has to be made or there, there's a requirement to refund portions of application fees after that period. Uh, that I don't expect will be an issue for the City of Kenora because we typically uh, approve site plan control applications uh, in under a month, so uh, uh, two months is uh, certainly not a challenge for us. Uh, so, so those are the main uh, details here. Uh, we're also proposing to update some terminology to reflect uh, current position descriptions within the uh, within the division within the planning section. Uh, and that's uh, I think that sums everything up. Council, that's important. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, Kevin, is this a good thing or yeah. like because I'm always leery about. <laughs> when they make changes in the planning act and they say it's supposed to be uh, supposed to streamline things, but we we always see that it doesn't. So, it's well, uh, calling things good or bad in planning can be very much a matter of perspective. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure there's some people that will see these, uh, and and, uh, and there's very good reasons. I expect that this was included in uh, Bill 109. Uh, there's uh, I think very loud lobby for. Uh, uh, keeping things administrative and removing some of the political involvement, uh, uh, but the, the also I, I certainly respect that you know this is traditionally something where elected officials had the ability to become uh, you know to be, make themselves the, the decision makers, um, and so. Um, yeah, I won't say it's good or bad. I'll say it, it accomplishes I think something that uh, you know that there was a vocal call for. 
Um, and then, then there's some changes in there, like the 60-day review period. There's cities like Toronto that are saying, well, 90% of our site plan applications don't get approved within 60 days, which isn't, <laughs> as I said, it isn't a concern here in Kenora, uh, thankfully, I'm, I'm happy to say, but uh, uh, I guess the, the delay was something that we're concerned about down there. I'll just I'll use the word pause. Is it a positive change then? So I won't use the other word. It's a positive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it accomplishes some things that I think that are generally positive. Thank you. I think Kevin just basically at the end of the day, this is a legislative change. Yeah, correct. It's not something you're proposing to council to consider. It, it's going to be legislative. Yeah, it's it's your bylaw to change, but we have to change it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think that's an important uh, differentiation because uh, when you mentioned about taking it out of the political arena and then it's legislated, it's not council saying we're taking this out of here because we're afraid of the political implications. It's a legislative change. Yeah. And I, I think that's important, so thank you. Yeah. Well, Councillor Smith, please. Uh, a comment on, uh, well, two comments, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that we're changing um, some of the terminology when it comes to positions. When I reviewed it, it hadn't, I noted that it hadn't been changed yet, like director and in planning, I just, mm -hmm. I just wanted to show you that I do read my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the other thing is, um, as Kevin said, it's legislated, uh, we have no choice over it, good or bad, indifferent, but um, it does removes remove um, the political body, which is what we do, and we represent our constituents um, as politicians, they're the first people they're going to they're come to when they have a problem. And site plan is an issue for many people, and you hear it lots of times um, when people um, are um, neighbors or reviewed. And we did have a deputation probably a year ago, which was an excellent deputation on the property that we were looking to rezone on the highway. And the deputant that came forward to council as a political body looking for site plan consideration, right? Mm -hmm. She had some excellent um, uh, suggestions. This was about the new, um, I think, property we were zoning for a hotel or something by um, Tim Hortons or mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if you recall that. But you actually mentioned, um, Mayor, to the planning committee, she, this, she has come forward, the neighbor has come forward with some excellent site plan suggestions that would mitigate some of the issues in the neighborhood. And um, so now we're, we're removed from it. So I would suggest to people they do have those kind of concerns, actually do come to a de depu do a deputation to council and council will refer them on to planning. So, you know, it, um, it's just an opportunity for the community to express and come up with some good suggestions um, when development directly impacts them. Yes, yes uh, through the chair. Just one, uh, one important additional note. One power that council does retain is when there's official plan and zoning bylaw amendments, as a condition of approval, council can require that there be site plan control approval. Uh, so that is something that is retained by council to require that there be that approval. It's just the approval is handled administratively. Okay, thanks, Kevin. That's good clarification. Yeah. Anything else? All right, thanks, Kevin. Uh, next, we'll... Councilor McMillan. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> we'll welcome Melissa, and Melissa <laughs> will walk us through the next one. Certainly, yes. So the recommendation is to give three readings to a bylaw to open up and establish a public lot highway. And before I elaborate on that recommendation, I'll just give a little bit of background on this one because it is a little unique. So in 2018, <coughs> the City of Kenora, in collaboration with the Ministry of Transportation and 24 property owners of Dupree Island North, did construct a parking lot off of the bypass. And the purpose of this was really to provide safe access for 28 water access only lots on Dufresne Island North. Um, as this uh, parking lot does provide public side road access off a highway, administratively through the Ministry of Transportation, we are required to make application for an entrance permit. And a road opening bylaw is one of those requirements for us to formally apply for an entrance permit. Now, in the recommendation, you'll note that it is a very small portion of the parking lot we're requesting that you open up and identify as a public highway. 
And just a note of, um, there was an error made in Schedule A. I do apologize for that, which actually incorrectly identifies the area as a 10 meter by 20 meter area. We've actually clawed that back to a 10 meter by one meter area. And that's where the recommendation, that's what the recommendation is today. And that's what I will re request that the bylaw read as well. So we are asking that you identify only a small portion of that parking lot right off of the bypass as a public highway, bearing no name. And there's a little bit of background and reason for mm -hmm. that. So we are required to make application for an entrance permit with MTO because it does provide access off the highway. But let's not forget, in 2017, Council did pass a bylaw under Section 326 of the Municipal Act that this project was partially funded by those residents of Dufresne Highland North. And so there is an important component here to maintain that parking lot for only the users of Dufresne Island North. Um, so th that's kind of where this, this one's a little bit different than some of the other road opening bylaws we see. Um, so that's basically the summary of the report. If there's any questions, I'll have to answer those. Council? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much. Welcome. All right. Um, we'll go around the table quickly then, and we'll start with Councillor Pori. Uh, nothing, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McMillan. I'm good, thank you. <coughs> Councillor Smith. Nothing today, thank you. Councillor Goss. Happy to see the waters are going <coughs> down, and uh, anticipating that uh, by mid mid August, I guess we might see some normal levels on the Lake of the Woods. Uh, I would encourage people who are driving to pay attention to the fact that uh, there still is a lot of debris floating around and uh, pay attention to uh, slowing down as you move past uh, shoreline structures that are, are obviously compromised. Thank you. Councillor Van Lonehan. No, I'm good, thanks. All right. Uh, the only thing I want to comment on, and I want to thank all my, uh, I was going to say staff, which isn't <laughs> That would really get you going, I can't <laughs> <laughs> Team around the table. I, Canada Day was a lot of fun. It was. And it was because seven of us working together, and we even, uh, somebody inadvertently walked by, and he was there for the entire time. So I want to thank Kyle. But I want to especially uh, Stace, extend uh, thanks to the staff. Like, so many positive comments about what transpired on Canada Day down at the harbor front. And that's because of a lot of work from behind the scenes from from the your team. So thank you very much. And again it was it was probably the best turnout we had with counselor and just all seven counselors, everybody working together. And the CAO I think probably didn't want to see a repair full for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks to everyone. It was it's just nice to see people happy and excited and enjoying themselves again. Which will lead to this week's, uh, I think our first street party is, or the street market is this Saturday. Yeah. Um, and so things are slowly coming back, which is, you know, it's good to see. The, the uh, what's the word you always use, Councillor Goss? When we have people all over the place? Oh, animation. Yeah. Animate the, animate the streets. Animate the streets. You go by the, um, where Beaver Tales now is, like, it's just a busy, active area. More restaurants have opened up that, uh, you know, it took a couple of years for some of them, but it, it's just good to see people out and about and uh, enjoy themselves. So thank you for that. Um, resolution number two, please. Um, that's me, I'm Mr. Chair, moving myself, set by Councillor Goss that pursuant to section 239 of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended, authorization is hereby given for council to move into a closed session at, time Heather? 10.42. 10.42 a.m. to discuss items pertaining to the following. Number one, disposition of land. One item, Central Park. Item two, educating and training members of council. One matter, CAO update. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. We are adjourned. <laughs>